It's all about engagement, isn't it? Hello, everyone. But it's not a pantomime. Okay, so uh, thanks very much to Ian for setting me up very nicely um, to talk to you about some of the lessons I learned from writing this book, uh, Pioneers of Digital Success Stories from Leaders in Advertising, Marketing, Search, and Social Media. And thanks to Jen for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, talk to you about some of the, 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 the kind of trends from this very much a history book. Uh, Ian was just thumbing through it and said, hey, it's like a history book, isn't it? And I said, yeah. Um, and why it's relevant to this conference is while you're all thinking about emerging technologies is to kind of take a step back into history and see what kind of things that uh, people came up against when they were first starting out on the internet. This always happens to me. Is, it, is the clicker plugged in? Uh, is it on? No, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, it's a new emerging technology for me. Got a lovely clicker. It is on. There we go. So, bit of background. Uh, I used to work at Microsoft for seven years. I started out um, in search engine marketing in a company called LookSmart. Who remembers LookSmart back in those days? Uh, yeah, really smart uh, business model. Um, I used to review 55 rev uh, sites a day and put them in a, a database. And then along came this thing called Google that could do my job in a fraction of a second. Um, I started at Microsoft in 2005 and helped launch Microsoft Ad Center, which uh, is now Bing Ads. And uh, then I started in this evangelism role where I would travel around the world and talk to people uh, and interview them and try and extract their wisdom. Um, I was there for seven years. And then last summer, and I've been living in Seattle for a, a couple of years, and then last summer, I got laid off. Uh, but it's okay because uh, it was a beautiful uh, relationship with Microsoft um, and my time is up really and uh, I started my own company, Delightful Communications and I help businesses and individuals with social media, digital PR and particularly personal branding. Now the idea for the book came from this chap called Paul Springer who's a professor of advertising technology over in the UK. Uh, I'd met him via my brother. Um, uh, my brother and his wife had met him and his wife on a, on a desert island in, uh, um, in the Grenadines when, when my brother was getting married and I think they showed up at the wedding. And uh, I met Paul at this dinner party and uh, it was one of those kindred spirits because he actually knew what I was talking about when I was talking about digital because the rest of my family haven't a clue. Uh, and he interviewed me for this book to, back in 2005 um, and I talked about Ad Center and its 50 case studies of great advertising uh, um, campaigns that happened between kind of mid mid 90s to 2005, and then I never heard from him again until a couple of years ago, where he said I've been lurking and following you online, and uh, you've been doing all these great interviews and stuff. I've got an idea for a new book uh, called Pioneers of Digital Advertising, and I said. Um, that's kind of limiting it a little bit. Why don't we broaden the scope? Because digital is much more than just advertising. There's social media and there's search and whatnot. So what we did is we went out and uh, we found 20 people willing to talk. He drew up a list of 20 people. I drew up a list of 20 people. I didn't know any of the people on his list. He didn't know any of the people on mine. And we spent months kind of going backwards and forwards, finding some really, really interesting people, some unsung heroes of the internet people who uh, you may not have heard of, but you would have heard of what they'd done. And what we did was we interviewed them, uh, and there are 20 um, uh, kind of chapters based on their career, their highs, their lows, how they got started, and how they see the future, and their advice to other people out there that are looking to get started in digital or you know, in, in technology through entrepreneurship. Uh, they're from all over the world, from the US, the UK, from India, from New Zealand, from China, and, uh, uh, and really a quite, quite a smorgasbord of uh, talents. The 
premise of the book was to tell their stories, because they'd never been told before, but then also to extract and try and figure out what was it about these people that really made them a success. And there are 10, uh, there, there are ten learnings, uh, 10 lessons at the end of the book. Uh, and I'm just going to talk about five here. The first, which is do not let technology dictate. I think uh, I, I've been reading a lot recently about um, strategy, where people talk about uh, uh, the, the fact that people get too bogged down with tactics. When I see a lot of strategy documents from clients that I take on, uh, it, it's like, well, this is our strategy. We're going to use YouTube and do this, and then we're going to do this on Facebook. We're going to do but that's actually looking at the technology and the tactics as opposed to building it back and relating it back to an overall strategy and an overall plan based on your brand and essentially what the outcomes you actually want. So the premise behind some of the people in the book, people like Chi Lu, Chi Lu uh, is now super famous for what he's done with Bing. Uh, he started out as a, um, uh, a teacher. In, I mean, the, the story's quite long about how he wanted to be a shipbuilder, but he couldn't because he was too small. And he wanted to be a scientist, but he couldn't in China because his eyesight wasn't very good. So uh, they said, right, uh, you can do computer science, and then you're going to work in a radio factory. He ended up as a teacher at the Fundang University in Shanghai. $10 a month he was earning, and he got discovered by a professor at Carnegie Mellon who said, oh, you ought to uh, come over and do a scholarship. And he said, I can't. He said, why ever not? Scholarship, you don't have to pay for anything. He said, I can't afford the $45 fee to do the scholarship. So the professor paid for it. He went to IBM. He worked on one of the very first search technologies, Harvester. Way back then, he was in the room when Sar uh, Larry and Sergey demoed uh, uh, Google Project Backrub back then in 97, 98. Uh, and then he went on to Yahoo. He built Yahoo Shopping in about three months with two contractors, ended up with repetitive strain injury in his hand and had to wear a cast. Um, and then he was there for 10 years and ended up managing 3,000 uh, engineers, software engineers. Then he decided to pack it all in, uh, and he was just literally at the gate about to go back to China when Steve Ballmer came knocking on the door and said, hey, why don't you come over and do something special with us at Microsoft in the online services division, where he is now uh, uh, doing great things with Bing and uh, a lot of super, squir uh, super secret squirrel stuff as well. But the point with him, when it talks about technology dictating, is for him, it's not about the search engine. It's not about beating Google at search. It's about being, having bold and audacious goals. You know, Bing being the decision engine, you know, it's less about... Uh, searching and more about doing. It's about how can we use technology to really, really help our daily lives. And he has a much, much broader view and vision, uh, which goes, you know, many, many years into the future. And when you actually sit down and talk to him, as I was lucky enough to do, you're like, how, how is this possible? But when you look back to when Bing started back in 2009, they have got a long way forward, especially with, you know, Bing cool with deals with, uh, um, with, with Facebook and really capitalizing on uh, the search and also the cross-device stuff that they've been doing with Windows Phone and, and the new Windows 8. But here, you know, he kind of has a Zen-like um, uh, uh, sort of image at Microsoft and certainly did at Yahoo where he's got these bold, audacious goals. He's got that strategy. He's got that vision and that mission but he's also thought about the steps in between. And that's how he, as a great leader, manages to filter that down and energize his team, who are then in charge of the tactics in order to achieve that goal. For him, uh, Stefan always talks about the fact that he's, he's very cool. He's very, very slight, very humble man. But when he talks, you, you, you just believe. And you get up, you go off and do whatever he asks you to do. That same sentiment about not letting technology dictate came from Thomas Gensmer, who kicks off the book. He uh, was the guy behind my Barack Obama, the whole Barack Obama social media campaign back in um, 2008, and then he was part of Blue State Digital again when, uh, uh, you know, in, in the recent um, elections. Uh, he, he's very much... Uh, interested in this kind of gray area where I work between communications, PR, and digital. Uh, 
but, but really, really is um, it's a number of really good quotes about how he talks about chief engine, uh, information officers and chief technology officers. Just because it's a technology company doesn't necessarily mean that these guys should be driving the agenda. At the end of the day, you need to have a good idea, and then you look at the technology that you've got in order to drive that idea home. So as he says, technology needs to support the core business instead of dictating how it works. Fascinating story about um, the, the whole Barack Obama uh, thing, especially when um, the, on one kind of website they put an email address on and they weren't set up for the infrastructure for people uh, to actually check who, who was actually mailing stuff in. And uh, after a couple of weeks he thought, well, hang on a minute, we ought to check that email address. Tap, 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 and out came like 100,000 emails from people from this particular campaign uh, that they pushed out. But they didn't have the infrastructure at that time to really capitalize on that back in uh, 2008. And obviously, they'd nailed it by 2012. Um, one of the, uh, the second uh, uh, lesson was make things that satisfy needs. Uh, I, I think that too often, we think, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? And I have a, um, a thing. It's not quite the same as conversation marketing. No one's picking it up yet, maybe after today. But I have a thing that I talk about, the so what factor. If I read a blog post, or if I'm editing a, a, a press release or, or something from, from one of my clients, I always have this, this kind of filter around the so what factor. At the end of it, I don't want to be going, well, so what? How is that relevant to me? How is, you know, what am I supposed to do next? Did I really need to read that? Did I need to spend two minutes watching that video? Satisfying needs is really, really important. Who here has seen a TED video? Who here has seen more than 20 TED videos? More than 30? 50? More than 60? You don't know? Well, there's someone very confident over there has read more than 60. Uh, I'll get your, I'll send you one. She had her hand up confidently the whole time. Oh, there you go. You can share it. All right. Because you've all contributed to TED delivering one billion video views online. That's one billion, but it nearly didn't happen. Not because of this woman. It happened because of this woman. Back in 2005, she was asked to, ha Chris, uh, to help Chris Anderson open out uh, um, uh, the TED conferences to the world. And how was she going to do that? Yes, what do you do when you want mass media? You go to television companies. And she went to television companies and they said, uh, no, that's the worst idea ever. Who is going to want to watch a 20-minute lecture by someone talking about how she had a stroke in the shower? Not really entertainment. We can't really sell advertising against that. So what she did was she thought about, you know, what, what, what do people need? YouTube was just coming on. Online video was starting to become easier to do back in those times. She'd started in 1991 as president of the Stanford Press. She'd done some of the very first uh, um, online video because the people at Apple were just down the road and they let them have a free copy of QuickTime and they put this on their internet and all this kind of stuff. So she went back to 1991 and got all her learnings and a friend of hers called Wish Now, uh, who's a, a, an editor chap, and they said, okay, well, what do people need? Well, they need to pass the time. They're reading blog posts. Why can't they watch videos? Why can't they be interested in, in that kind of intersection of, I've got the internet, as Ian talks about that intersection, I've got the internet, and I'm interested in philosophy or I'm interested in theology, or I'm interested in architecture. So that's where they started building out um, those, uh, those videos. And what you don't know, or may not know, is now those videos are so supremely edited. They have eight cameras at any one time focusing on. And next time you watch one, you will never see someone saying, oh, yes, hello, very nice to meet you. Is it? <coughs> Sorry I'm late. Uh, yeah, it's nice sun shining. They cut straight to the start of it. You never hear an if, a but, a stumble. You never see anything that isn't a crisp, lean forward experience, which is why you suddenly get to the end of that 18 minute video and you're like, wow, that was amazing. My God, I've just actually watched something on YouTube for 18 minutes, which is very, very rare. 
And what they said was, it's all about testing. It's all about looking at consumer needs, looking at consumer trends, and then working on it. But always testing, coming back, then moving a little bit more forward. Not going, hey, we need to do this, 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 and this. Always trying to satisfy a need through testing. Taking decisions in real time. This is kind of the whole social media thing. Uh, opposite, where are we? Where's the street? Where's Second Avenue? Just down there. Is it just down there? Or well, somewhere down there. Anyway, within a block of this uh, office is Vanessa Fox's office. Vanessa Fox was the woman behind uh, Google Webmaster Tools. She was actually based in Kirkland at the time, again back in 2005, 2006. And she got hired to do this crazy sitemap project where Google were going to try and get all these people to submit their sitemap. But it was a, oh, it was a bit of a sh dodgy time back there in SEO land because you had Matt Cutts saying, oh, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that. He was a very much, you know, still, you know, chief of the, the web span team. And you suddenly had this woman, smart woman, not from Mountain View, not a computer scientist, I think she's got a, a degree in history or English or something, um, who was suddenly on the other side of the fence trying to have a dialogue with people using the, the, the basic community. When I started back in uh, at Microsoft in 2005, I, I was the uh, ad center community manager. This is before social media as we know it, before the Twitters and the Facebooks. And she was doing a similar thing. And it was all about a value exchange. So what she would do is she would go into, uh, um, she, uh, I I into the offices of, of, of the different departments within Google and, and say, we want to give these webmasters some information so that they can build their websites better. And they were like, no, 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 we don't do that because they're, they're just going to spam us. So well, why don't you take a look at this community? Take a look at what they're talking about. Have a look at their problems and their issues and their frustrations. And, and Tell me what your frustrations are. They said, oh, it costs us so much money in tickets and support every time um, a, a really great website doesn't have any titles and descriptions on it. And then we have to go through and we have to do this thing where we have to manipulate this and all this kind of stuff. And when you add it all up, it costs a hell of a lot of money. She said, well, why don't you come up with a mechanism to tell these people down here, the webmaster, that they've got 600 pages that don't have to... Can we do that? Yes, of course we can do that. So it was kind of that value exchange where she would also be out in that community in real time at all the conferences and then when Twitter started and, uh, and uh, a lot more of the, you know, when social media sped up a little more, she was always there interfacing with people and, and being able to take decisions quicker rather than waiting for two month, three month uh, development cycles really did uh, have an impact on uh, uh, on Google's perception amongst webmasters, uh, but also with, uh, obviously, the quality of their windows. I couldn't get the numbers out of them of how many uh, people initially got submitted to the index, but any of you who are geeky uh, SEOs who remember that time, uh, people would submit their site uh, to uh, the site match URL, and, uh, and then Vanessa would see, and this is all in the book, Vanessa would see all these people saying, I submitted it to the URL and my whole site's dropped out of the index, uh, which she found amusing because they hadn't actually connected it to the index at that particular time. So there were still these conspiracy theories, which means that, you know, same as today, there's always going to be some conspiracy and some uh, uh, consternation out there, whatever you're trying to do of value. This chap is Jaron Lanier, the father of virtual reality. He works at Microsoft Research now. Uh, he started off at Atari. He was a, a, a goat herder and a goat cheese maker, and his, one of his best friends when he used to walk home from school was uh, the guy that discovered Pluto, and they used to make telescopes together. Um, totally random, as was the fact that uh, the film The Lawnmower Man is about Jaron Lanier. Can you see the similarity between Pierce Brosnan and Jaron Lanier? Neither can he. He finds it completely ridiculous, and I actually informed him in our interview that uh, there was actually a Lawnmower 2 movie that he didn't know about, um, but he had a little smile about it. Minority Report, he's the guy behind uh, a lot of that um, stuff that Tom Cruise does in that. He advised Steven Spielberg all about that. Um, what's interesting about him is, is now he, he wrote a book called uh, You Are Not a Gadget, 
um, which I thoroughly recommend, which made my brain bleed uh, because it is so, uh, um, it, it, it's quite heavy, but it's very, very smart stuff about the fact that he used to, st he started the internet. He was there back in Silicon Valley when it happened. And now he has a problem with the way that it's going. He has a problem with uh, social media. And, and now he's all over the Wall Street Journal and, and all of, he's doing this book tour uh, where he's getting a hell of a lot more press than we got for our book, um, talking about his new book, Who Owns the Future, where now he's suggesting that Google and Facebook and maybe Microsoft need to pay us for using our information and our data. And he talks about these micropayments and all this kind of stuff. Fascinating stuff, but again, taking decisions in real time and, and really understanding social media and direct response and quick response. How many times have we seen this? The web 2.0 thing you built me didn't actually increase sales. How many times are we so introverted about our cool little widget because it's got social written all over it and there's a like button and everything? If it doesn't satisfy needs, then you've wasted a hell of a lot of time and money. Um, what was fascinating, uh, for, well, great for us about the book is ever since we wrote it, things keep, still keep changing. I think three of the agencies that um, are guys in the, in the book um, have, have been sold to some of the, the holding companies. Uh, Martha Lane Fox from lastminute.com in the UK. She's been made a lady or a lord, uh, which I think is a lady. A baroness, so she's in the House of Lords and all this kind of stuff. This kind of stuff, uh, um, proximity, marketing, advertising, based on, is, is all starting to happen, happening, you know, with RFIDs at Disney and all this kind of stuff. So it's really fascinating to hear um, what, what people like Jaron were thinking about, not only back in the 80s, but as recently as about 18 months ago. Here's him talking at uh, the Mix conference. There's no such thing as passive perception. Young people today will remember our media as quaint, cute, but not quite fully engaged. Uh, he has some really, really great ideas about how we can really capitalize on this going forward. Uh, and then there's Avinash Kaushik, and I, I threw him in there. He was a fascinating interview, very well prepared. I actually had to cut him short after an hour and 20 minutes because uh, I was paying a transcriber one dollar a minute, and you know it was really cutting into my budget because he had so much to say. But if you've ever seen his blog, Occam's Razor, which is pretty awesome, uh, you'll see that his mantra is all about providing things that are incredible, relevant, and of value. He's very, very, um, uh, very sociable uh, on, on the social networks, especially Google+, Plus, because he works there as their digital marketing evangelist. But my point with him is when it, when it comes to reacting to things in, in real time, uh, he has no problem going in and talking to some of the top CMOs in the world and evangelizing and telling them and beating them over the head with a big club, a big ugly club, saying you've got to capitalize on what he calls the magnificent opportunity that technology and digital now provides people in order to really get ahead of the game and stand head and shoulders above your, um, above your competitors. And there's a great shot about how um, he had a Kalashnikov held to his head. Uh, but more of that in the book. You don't have to be original, just relevant. Loved, loved what Ian was talking about, of copycats and all this kind of stuff. Um, th this was a through line amongst uh, a lot of the people in the book. Um, the, the, the most vociferous in his response was Gabash Chahal, who's just turned 30. Quite a looker, isn't he, ladies? Uh, he um, has just turned 30, but he actually had click agents back in 98 and sold that to Valley. He's always been ahead of the curve. He was doing behavioral targeting back in the mid-2000s. He sold that company to Yahoo for $300 million. Uh, huh? Yeah. Um, he's, th he's just turned 30. Um, and now he's got Radium 1. Uh, he is a fascinating chap. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I now know why I don't have 300 million uh, in the back. I was in Cannes at the advertising festival and he was there and we were out having a few drinks and it was sort of two in the morning and we're in the Carlton bar and there's all these young, oh, they're all drinking champagne out of big photos and up goes on Facebook. 
and I say there's going to be a few sorry, uh, so sorry tagging uh, episodes tomorrow morning after all this. And he said, you know what, the ne uh, in 20 years' time, the presidential ele election will be decided by social media. And I thought, what? What do you mean 20 years' time? How, c how are you an internet pioneer? What are you doing in my book? You know, later on this year, you know, the election's going to be decided by uh, um, social media. And he said, no. He said, because there's probably five or six people in this room that want to run for office. And in 20 years' time, these photos will still be out there. And someone's going to drag them back and say, aha, but this is how you behaved now that you're talking about blah, blah, blah. And I was like, damn, that's why he's got 300 million in the bank, and I don't. But absolutely fascinating. What he says about originality, if you don't want to disrupt the market, if you want to disrupt the market, don't necessarily do something brand new. See what people are already doing. But once you've scaled that, incorporate once you want to bring that's new. You need traction on what people are already doing, existing. Bit. So it's actually pivoting around an existing idea, being agile, quick, smarter. I think there are too many entrepreneurs go, oh, I've got this idea about this app for fathers on Father's Day and babies and all this kind of stuff. iTunes store or app store, blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, it exists. I better go off and do something else. If you can actually be quicker and smarter, and pivot around an idea, then you can get ahead of the game. Like this chap, Jeff Bezos, very local chap, obviously, Amazon. Um, he got, now, now that Steve Jobs has, has left us, uh, he got uh, Fortune Business Person of the Year last year. And he talks about copying other people's stuff. It's very important not to be hermetically sealed. You want to look at it and say, that's very interesting. What can we? be inspired to do as a result of that, and then put your unique twist on it. I discovered the other day, I went to Sasquatch. OK, I'm 40. I shouldn't really have been going there. It was quite an eye-opener, especially as I have a nearly two-year-old daughter who is not going to Sasquatch before she's 18. Um, and I came back with all this new music, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And I did a search for Mumford and Sons, rocking out. They're actually from my part of London. Um, uh, actually, and I bought the CD and this thing popped up and said um, uh, you can auto rip and download your stuff with the Amazon cloud player and I bought the CD because I'm 40 and I have a very nice CD player, not high end but mid range that I bought five years ago and I'm still going to buy CDs because I like, to put, I, I like that, I'm of that ilk but what annoyed me was when I bought my ultra Lenovo book thing it doesn't have a CD drive. So I was asking my wife, do you have a CD drive? Because then I want to copy these things in there and everything. Suddenly, Amazon have taken the best of iTunes and CDs and put them all there. So I get the CD for my home stereo system, and they send me an email, and I just click and download all the things straight onto my SD card and, and, and my phone. And there's no need to put a CD and use a CD drive and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely genius, just pivoting around, around an idea. And having a look at, you know, my demographic, people like me, who are still into music, but still like to hang on to old media. Lastly, is have fun. Um, the final chapter in the book uh, is about Stephen Fry, who at least someone's heard of. Do you all know Stephen Fry? British actor, comedian, raconteur, Lord of the Dance, Prince of Swimwear, his uh, Twitter following. He's been very kind to us, tweeting to his six million followers, asking them to buy our book. Um, he is a manic depressive. He did a, um, he, he's always been into technology. He did a, uh, a, a TV show documentary back in the mid 2000s. He had a blog and he used to write for The Guardian about technology. Uh, and he did this show on TV, basically exposing the fact that he was a manic depressive and bipolar and all this kind of stuff. And he got 5,000 letters a week to his agent. And uh, his business partner, the guy behind all the stuff he does here, is Andrew Sampson. Um, and Andrew Sampson's from Australia and uh, literally emailed, there's an interview with me and him online somewhere, emailed Stephen Fry and said, I could help you with your website. And this was back in the early 2000s. And... Uh, they all had it set up, forums. And it was the time to switch the button. 
and they switched the button, and he went onto his blog, and he said, all you people sending me letters about your, you know, manic depression, all that kind of stuff, go onto the forums. Let's do it online. Let's have the conversation online. When he first got told about Twitter, uh, he said, um, oh, that's a silly thing, and he put it in a drawer, uh, and he wasn't really interested in it until he went on a trip to uh, uh, travel across Africa. And he, well, they were using text messages. And he suddenly picked up all these followers and all these followers and all these followers. And that's when he realized the power of what he was doing on Twitter. What this uh, uh, photo was, he got stuck in a lift and he tweeted this in 2009, in an elevator, sorry. Uh, in 2009, it went viral. Uh, the New York Times said that it did more for Twitter uh, and social media than uh, Ashton Kutcher's picture of Demi Moore's bottom. Uh, it ended up on uh, front page uh, of newspapers all over the world, including New Zealand, um, India, all over the place, just to show the power of that moment in time. What he says about digital is that you have to love it. You absolutely have to love it. Just enjoy the ride, enjoy the creativity that it gives you. What you've got to be driven by is what effing fun it is and how unbelievably exciting digital is and the opportunities that you've got. Uh, it was a real pleasure to spend time with him in the snooker room of the Groucho Club where he saw Noel Gallagher and Damon Albarn uh, bashing each other over the head in the late 90s with snooker cues. That was a nice little anecdote for me. So, wrapping up, five pioneering DNA. This is only five out of the full ten. But don't let technology dictate. You've got to have a great idea first. Make things that satisfy needs. Actually, go out, ask your, <laughs> ask your customers, what do you need? Really? You'd be surprised how many businesses don't even do that and they just assume. Take decisions in real time. This social media thing, man, isn't going anywhere. It's only going quicker. You don't have to be original, just relevant, and have fun. We've had uh, a really great uh, response and reaction um, to the book, which has been wonderful. I love seeing these keywords, inspirational, contagious, fascinating, etc. Um, it's on Amazon for 99 cents because they won't put it back up to the original price. But we don't care. You never make money out of books. And now, i got to dash soon, but there are my contact details. Uh, visit the website. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Jen for having me. And uh, be happy to take any questions.